So now we'll be witnessing the decoding B2B SaaS product management to unlock hyper growth along with the moderator, Mr. Ratnakumar Nagarajan, the Chief Product Officer of Ketone. Along with the panelist, Mr. Kaushik Ram Krishnasai, the Director of Product Management, Kisflow. Mr. Bharat Srinivas Rangan, the Senior Vice President of Products, M2P Fintech. And Ms. Sai Chitra Swaminathan, the Chief Product Officer, Matrimony.com. A beginner of applause, please, delegates. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Ratna, and uh, I'm part of a company called Cater. It's a B2B SaaS product. And today we are going to uh, try and see how we could uh, decode uh, the B2B SaaS product management for hypergrowth. So I've got some exciting uh, panelists here who have been part of uh, some very good companies in the last 20 years. Um, I've got uh, Sai uh, from Bharat Matrimony, where she will be talking about uh, the B2C, how lines are diminishing from B2C to B2B and business to human, and what is the growth potential, and how her journey has been in terms of uh, driving the growth on the GTM side. And then we have... Uh, Bharat from M2P.in, which is uh, more of a, um, a fintech company, providing services for banks and more fintech companies. So they don't have a face. It's more an API-based uh, company, but then we would want to talk about that as well. And then we have Kaushik from Kissflow, uh, which is, um, I mean, everyone knows about Kissflow and the Suresh as a superstar. So we'll talk more about how they are evolving from a product to a platform. So that's the overall idea. Just to set the context as well, <coughs> uh, I mean, I was talking to a few guys on how companies are looking to transform uh, themselves digitally. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, uh, the role of B2B SaaS, or for that matter, any SaaS company, the kind of opportunities is huge. Um, you've been looking at many companies who have taken up this digital route and with COVID happening, it becomes very imperative that uh, companies, the way they do business, they have to drive the digital transformation. And, and there's quite a lot of opportunities on how B2B can contribute uh, or the SaaS can contribute for this digital transformation. Globally, if you look at it, there are only 20% of the companies which have transformed digitally. And 80% of the companies are still trying to transform. Right, and, and those, uh, and they call digitally distorted companies. Basically, there is a LOB department, a commercial department, or a sales department trying to transform, or someone in the operation side trying to transform, and, but, but the transformation has not happened in a holistic way. And that provides a huge opportunity for us in terms of how we could drive it. And, uh, and basically, the, the, the number of unicorns that we have had in, from India or globally itself, uh, the numbers are quite staggering uh, on the B2B space. And there's still a huge space in terms of how the technologies are evolving. Uh, with the advent of the third platform like AAML, blockchain, AR, VR, uh, the kind of possibilities that we have to do a startup on the B2B space uh, and how you can drive value for the end customer. Um, that, that's quite encouraging, and the kind of opportunities that we have for the next 15, 20 years is humongous. Uh, and, and then we will try and see how we can learn from these group and take some, something out when we go out from here. So that's the whole idea of this panel discussion. So I'll start with Sai. Um, so Sai has been with uh, Bharat Matrimony since inception, and she's been instrumental in driving lots of product lines uh, and how how that has been taken to the market. I mean, you might think why a B2C person is sitting here, but the idea is to give a flavor, a perspective of how lines are diminishing, right? Uh, with respect to a B2B or a B2C company, end of the day, it's an interaction with a human. So we call it B2H. And uh, my first question to her would be, uh, I mean, how, how did they roll out so many products? Uh, like, and they got listed as well. And what has been her experience in terms of uh, driving the go-to-market? One of the important pieces of B2B, and if I have to box it into three, one is the go-to-market, one is the product engineering itself, 
and, and the technology part of it. So, and, and to stay true to the topic on how the hyper growth happens, what did you do, Sai, and how did you make it happen on, on the 300, 350 product uh, lines that you have? How do you go about doing the go-to-market for that? Thanks, Ratna. Um, so, interesting question. Um, so, uh, many of you might be knowing matchmoney.com. Uh, we have been into consumer internet business for more than two decades now. And uh, uh, interestingly, um, like how other ecosystems have been evolving, matchmaking also has been evolving. So, what we started with and what we have now is totally different product. Like Ratna was mentioning, we have 350 plus products that we cater to different set of users when it comes to matchmaking. And um, uh, the challenge with such a scale is that uh, you'll have to have sometimes different strategies for marketing your products because the TG might be very different. I'll give you some examples. Uh, so if you look at, there are very uh, mainstream products that we have like Bharat Matrimony uh, or so, which can be, you know, uh, marketed initially it was like you know through the conventional methods but then uh, now it is easy to market either through mass media or a combination of mass media and digital mostly on social and also uh, you know with respect to uh, other platforms other mediums like influencer and so on so this is kind of easy for a mainstream product like Bharat Matrimony but when we take the specific products that we have for example we have a product called Jodi this is a vernacular product uh, that we launched a year back. Interestingly, uh, vernacular poses a different challenge altogether. Uh, we will have to uh, communicate to that TG because this is a product which we are targeting a different socioeconomic status of people. These are for people who are in different frontline jobs like, you know, cooks or delivery executives, auto drivers, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, some segment like that. So the problem was if you go mass media, then you might uh, create a negative impact on the mainstream product because some people might move to this. So targeting precisely for these kind of products becomes very, very critical. So what we do is uh, when we plan the go-to-market strategy, we look at what is the TG, where should we go after, and we decided to go digital mostly because we found that precise targeting is possible only when we go digital and we don't uh, get into too many overlaps in the target segment and hence we are safe. With respect to uh, the other newer ways of marketing, right, this is also sometimes important. Being a very traditional product ourselves, we have, uh, you know, some new products that we have launched recently. For example, I was talking to uh, the panel members offline. We launched a product for the LGBTQ community. It's a standalone product, nothing to do with Bharat Matrimony, but it is from the same matrimony.com group. It's called Rainbow Love. We launched it on September 6th this year. That's exactly on the Indian Pride Day because we believed that this community also needs a product like that to find a partner uh, for them. And uh, we decided uh, to go on a complete influencer marketing route because go-to-market strategy, if we go with mainstream uh, mass media or if we go just with social media, it's not going to be easy because many platforms, including Facebook, do not allow you to target using gender identity. It is kind of banned. So we decided to use influencer marketing as one of the mediums because that kind of precisely tells us if there is a pride community person and if the person is influential in the community, then uh, communicating about the brand through that person is going to really be helpful for reaching that TG. So I think at the nutshell, uh, if you are go looking at marketing a new product, the basic thing is what is the TG? What should be uh, you know, uh, our marketing strategy to reach the maximum? And for us, there is also a very, very different challenge, which many of you may not have, the gender skew. When we market, we'll have to ensure that we have both male and female users because end of day, it is the ecosystem, the health of the ecosystem or the product revolves around this, right? We need to have a healthy proportion of male and female users to do, do the matchmaking. So sometimes some channels work brilliantly well for male, but they don't work for female. So it is, it's very uh, uh, important for us from the marketing standpoint to understand this and go after uh, you know, people who can spend, who can be monetizable, who can, you know, basically our rule of thumb is very, very clear. If you are going to a marketing strategy for a new product, that should be one, scalable, 
two, it should be monetizable, and three, it should give us a perfect mix of male and female members. That's how we basically look at it. With respect to the product stream of how we handle 350 products, yes, it is a big challenge because we'll have to evolve, we'll have to keep improving all these products. But thankfully, now there is a technology which always helps, like Android, for example, gives you so many options to handle multiple app versions, flavors, branches, etc. So it is an effort, but I think it is important from the marketing standpoint because from ASO benefit or for you know having better stickiness on the customer side, these uh, kind of you know, diverse products are important. Even though there is going to be some engineering overhead, I think it's perfectly fine. This is my take on you know, how to plan a marketing uh, strategy when you are developing a new product in the B2C, especially if it's precisely targeted on a specific TG of users. Hope I answered your question, Arthur. Thanks, Thanks Sai. I think one of the important takeaway is uh, how do you maintain a, a single code base or close to a single code base and then still try and deliver 350 product lines. That, that's quite interesting. From the perspective of uh, marketing and the target group audience and how you still avoid the overlap and, and be specific to that product line and try and see how it can be scalable, how it can be monetized and uh, and still still stick to the integrity of the code base is very important because as you grow i mean you you cannot stick to one product line you can start with one sliver but uh, eventually if you have to scale from 0 to 1 or 1 to 5 5 to 10 10 to 100 uh, the the amount of uh, the number of adjacencies or the product lines that you have to roll out is something that you have to keep doing you cannot stay at the and, and the kind of tech stack that you have to keep improving. So uh, from that perspective, thanks, Sai. But I'll come back to you on, on a connected question later. Well, before that, I'll go to uh, Bharat. So Bharat, Bharat is from M2P, and uh, they are a fintech company. So compared to what Sai is doing on Bharat Matrimony in terms of uh, product lines, they are focused more on the banks. Um, they don't have a face, if I can say that. It's a faceless product that they have. Uh, because it integrates with a lots of core banking solutions and uh, fintech companies. And he's been part of uh, Best Buy. He's been a, a, a product manager. He's driven quite a lot of strategy for Best Buy in US and, and comes with a huge experience in terms of how, how he drives his business. So just to, just to stay with B2B SaaS hyper growth, right? So how do you see it is different from what SaaS has been doing on the B2C space and how it is for you on the enterprise segment in terms of driving growth, right? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Ratna, and uh, I hi to everyone. Very good morning. Uh, uh, really pleased to be a part of this panel and uh, share my thoughts here. Um, so for me, hyper growth, right, it's, it's not uh, something extrinsic I see that you necessarily go through uh, as part of your product evolution, but something that you need to intrinsically build as part of your uh, product delivery process, right? That has been something that I've been very passionate about, uh, both from a practice as well as like a routine perspective that, that we can build. And uh, kind of, it's a, it's a big shift in approach or a mindset from how a product manager approaches uh, their work, right? So, so for me, it's, it's not a big uh, step change that you then step into, okay, this quarter I'm going to focus on hyper growth, right? That's typically not, not how it works. So, it needs to be a part of their own, say, quarterly planning. It needs to be a part of every story they write. It's, it's, it's a part of the research they do. It's part of other competitive analysis they do, other technological advancements that come by, things like that. And, and one typical example is, uh, though, we, though M2P FinTech is eight years old, we are already in our fifth version of our architecture. The same stack, the same capabilities, we've constantly been evolving and getting it to a scale that right now are able to uh, say handle millions of again billions of transactions every day right so it's not like we uh, uh, we see that as something uh, separately coming on board and, and and do that as a separate parallel activity but a lot of the focus has so far been in building it as part of your own process so right through your own say uh, prioritization process which is at the say very core of say what a product manager does um, because you'll, you'll always keep uh, 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 asks coming in from the BD team, from tech support with say existing issues or with operational efficiencies we need to drive, things like that. But the the art of again product management comes in where you find the overlap between what you want to do by taking that incremental next step and kind of marrying it with the external asks that's kind of adding that value back to the company. Right. So that 
has been something I've been very focusing on as we again built the product team at MTP over the last couple of years, and also again in my uh, previous experiences. So that way, um, you are also kind of making it part of the process, not making it say one person dependent where it's not just I call the shots and say, I need to bring in uh, say a new way of doing uh, uh, our business or by building a product differently to then kind of enable hyper growth uh, uh, separately. Uh, so that that has been again the, 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 the motto we've, we've been following and uh, what we've been trying to kind of enable hyper growth through again the, the product management cycle intrinsically. Right, right. thanks Parat. So the idea is to um, take it small with a group of customers enterprise segment, try to understand the requirements from them in terms of the feature request, trying to prioritize uh, what should be delivered so that there is value for the end customer before driving it as a complete productization internally within the product. And, and prioritization becomes a huge thing for you in terms of how you take it up. Absolutely, absolutely, right? and, and um whether we, do, we take it up, uh, say, to a smaller set of customers, like a CUG or a pilot with, say, few customers without probably disrupting their own, say, experiences too much. Or it could be that we have, say, silent listening modes in how we make some of these changes. And then <clears throat> we can always go back with data to say, hey, if we had kind of then made this change, it would have resulted in, say, X value, right? So there are, again, many methods we, we do currently employ in kind of going after those, those iterations that we run by to back it up with data to then go back to our customers to say this is why this additional feature makes sense and, and adding that value back to them. Thanks, thanks. I'll, I'll come back to you again uh, before I want to pick the brains of Kaushik. So Kaushik has been a, has been a co-founder in his earlier avatar, did a tour my app uh, and did some exit and then he's part of Kissflow right now along with Suresh Ramadam building um, the product and the platform. And he's been with Kisslow for the last 10 years. So a connected question to you as well. Now, uh, we have seen, I mean, Kisslow, we have seen it right from day zero, I would say. We know Suresh Ramandam and uh, how the product has evolved and what it has gone through. Now, like how Bharat mentioned in terms of fifth version of the product, how do you keep up with the pace in terms of the technology that's evolving? Um, and, and uh, be relevant on the tech space and still create value for the end customer and give a better experience in terms of driving the product. How, how do you keep up with that pace for such a long time and what has been your experience there with respect to, the, uh, with respect to embracing the cutting edge technology and still ensure that the value is driven? Over to you, Koshi. Um, so, uh I used to hear this phrase every time we are in Singapore. They say, same, same, but different, <laughs> right? Um, so um, Kisplo's story has been uh, same, same, but different over the last 23 years now. Um, we started off, uh, uh, Kisplo's parent company, Orangecape, started off with the mission of um, democratizing app development, right? But what we understood of the market um, and uh, uh, what we built as a solution has uh, changed over the last uh, 25 years or so, 20, 23 years to be clear. So we um, initially said, hey, you know what, we want business users to start developing applications. That's how it started. And what was the closest thing that business users were very comfortable with back then? Uh, MS Excel. So uh, we'll create a system uh, where someone uh, creates their entire application through Excel sheets and formulae, and we will magically convert it over into uh, a working application. Um, so uh, this is metadata-based engineering. This is rule engines uh, uh, that were implemented. And uh, we were, in fact, patented for uh, what we, uh, uh, for our rule engine, like way uh, earlier. Then cloud came, and um, we had to uh, embrace, suddenly everyone was talking about cloud. And uh, we, uh, the first version of uh, our system was a client-server model uh, that was created. And then cloud came, and we wanted to embrace cloud. Um, so um, we, we have never been too minded about like jumping on technologies. Um, uh, we were uh, the first company in India, if I remember correctly, who jumped onto the Google App Engine. And um, 
we moved our entire system to the Google App Engine uh, over a period of uh, a couple of months. Um, so yeah, jumping on to like new technology has not been something that was uh, that we have been scared of, but that has also shot us in our foot every now and then. So Google App Engine was cutting edge uh, around 29, uh, 2009 to uh, 12, but it also was extremely limiting in uh, terms of what it could like uh, uh, help us do. Uh, since then, um, our, uh, that was when Kissflow was also born. Um, so two things were happening. One, from a product standpoint, we were refining our ideas on what it meant to democratize app development, what it meant to make app development accessible to a majority of folks in organizations. And uh, so, um, in fact, uh, the huge platform that we had built previously called Visual Pass, we cut it down. Uh, only the top of the iceberg was like repurposed uh, and uh, sold as Kissflow. And then Kissflow in itself evolved from a workflow and approval cycle management only for Google Apps users to a low code, no code uh, platform, which it is uh, right now. So uh, more use cases were introduced uh, into our platform. Uh, in, and that way, in fact, that is also very closely tied to the hyper growth question, right? Um, so um, that was also a business necessity for us. For example, uh, um, what we believed is, I mean, the simplest way of like saying growth is essentially ensuring that we say, hey, you know what? We step into more organizations, we grow in these organizations, and we try not to die in these organizations, as in like avoid churn. And to step into organizations, we realized that Kissflow in its first of uh, second uh, versions was very limiting. So we wanted to introduce more capabilities which would help it transform into a work platform per se from a workflow platform alone. Um, then uh, this also helped us with our growth because, hey, you know what? more use cases were unfolded uh, that organizations can like use. And finally, um, you know, the advantage of being a platform company is that there's huge stickiness. So the more and more use cases uh, organizations essentially, uh, you know, um, start implementing on top of our platform, it's that much more harder for people to like leave the platform. So yes, um, all along, We've been like trying new technologies, but on the other side, uh, we had tried to stay very relevant uh, to what we set out doing, essentially creating a work platform uh, which can be used in the modern context. So that's the entire story. Thanks, Koshik. So, so one of the things that Kissflow has done is they have evolved as a product starting from an Excel, and as it's what Koshik mentioned, and embracing the latest uh, tech and kind of trying to um, sell with they call, uh, where they kind of listed along with the Google marketplace and grew along with them for a while, um, moved it to the cloud. So one of one of the important thing in terms of if if there are uh, founders who are into zero to one category, the one important thing that Kissflow did was to uh, drive it through an existing marketplace, which was Google. But of course, the marketplace has, has got crowded right now in terms of how you drive. You still have to stand out. You still have to find ways to uh, make it unique. But that's one of the important criteria to, to move the needle in terms of the growth factor. And also, embracing the technology is not for the sake of just uh, uh, you know being on the latest tech. It has to still drive the value. It has to still serve the purpose. It has to still... Um, drive what the customer wants. So not, not just uh, upgrading in terms of what's happening in the uh, tech space, but uh, it, should, it should still uh, drive the user experience and, and how you drive it is what Kaushik is saying. But then coming back to Sai, I have one more question for you, Sai. So you did mention about when you roll out a product, you look at the scalability part of it, the monetization part of it, and uh, and uh, so how, how do you look for those opportunities? You, you started a sector where it was so unorganized, right? I mean, uh, it's an unorganized sector that you got into it, and you, you guys are a listed company right now. Um, so, and then you've been there from day zero. So walk me through some of the 
some of the ways how you identify those opportunities and uh, you know how you go for a new product line and how, how do you look at the competition um, so can, can you talk a few lines about that side yeah. thanks Ratna, for the question again a very interesting question so uh, one rule of thumb uh, that we always follow is if we don't identify white spaces and launch a product someone else is going to do that so these white spaces are going to be there around and sooner or later somebody is going to identify that so it's better if we identify and we launch a product than waiting for somebody out of the blue moon to come and launch something new, right? So that is the uh, philosophy with which matrimony.com always operates. That is how we got into this 350 plus products. And I, uh, I'm sure uh, like that is uh, when it comes to matchmaking, uh, there is lots to uncover. So uh, what happens is there are, there are two, three uh, things that gives us signals for these, right? The first one is uh, obviously the customers. I think that is the core of the product. So from product team, like every week, we keep spending hours together every week to talk to our customers because what we believe is that whatever we design, whatever we develop as a product, we might visualize it in a way uh, that you know uh, the product or the UX folk has thought through, but the end user might use it slightly differently. So unless until we see how they use it, we talk to them and understand the pain points or the stated and unstated needs. It is literally impossible to improve the user experience. That is something we strongly believe, so it is mandatory for all of us in the product team to talk to customers, to spend time with customers, see how customers use the product, et cetera. So from that, we get lots of insights. Sometimes our customers, trust me, some of our customers have given us product ideas saying, hey, you should launch this. The recent rainbow love that I told you uh, for LGBTQ was from a customer. So there was one person who approached me and said, hey, you guys have a product for every community. And being a leader, why don't you have something for pride community? And we thought, yeah, why not? We should actually launch some product for them. So we launched. Like that, uh, there were many, like doctors matrimony, what we launched was also on a popular demand because doctors wanted that. They said, we don't have time to search for you know, on our own. And especially during COVID, people were like, like no, they were, they were literally pressed against time. They said, like, we want a service like this, where you can actually help us out, find a match and many doctors we do know that right many doctors prefer a doctor so we launched it so one uh, you know uh, uh, channel for us to get these white spaces or product ideas or launches that we should go after is our customers themselves the second yeah the second one that we do is with respect to you know a competition obviously we keep a tab on it one thing that we are very clear of is like there is nothing wrong in uh, looking at what competition does we have this again one more philosophy from which which is a uh, part of the protocol in matrimony is imitate innovate and improvise sure. so we look at competition if the product feature is really good if the product is really good there is no harm in learning from that and implementing it maybe you can innovate a little better you can improvise it a little better and give a better product better feature to your consumer but there is always a big benefit when we keep our eyes and ears open so we're always we always feel competition is good and we always look for learnings from the competition the third important thing that uh, we do is uh, again we look at global trends we keep an eye uh, on what is emerging at a global level because we have seen whatever comes uh, globally in few years down the line it picks up in india so we always keep uh, a tab on that and we try to identify white spaces based on that and we go ahead and launch it in fact, if you look at, I don't know how many of you know, we even have products for uh, the uh, global space. We have a brand, a parallel brand called Global Matrimony, and we serve to countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh. We have our office in Dhaka too. So that's another area, right? So these are some of the things that we do. And with respect to how uh, we go after these, uh, I always keep telling this to my team, right? When it comes to product, there is no dearth of ideas. We get too many ideas and that becomes a problem by itself because you cannot execute everything. And customer doesn't want everything end of day, right? So we always look at this question, is this going to be what the customer wants? We generally ask the product managers this, okay, this idea is great, this product feature is fine, but is the consumer going to pay for it? Yeah. If the customer is not going to pay for it, then it's not going to help, right? So we always look at leader, killer and filler, that's our terminology. We look at product features, if they are really leader, uh, no leader kind of uh, uh, style of product features which the customer is going to really ask for use and going to pay for then it is a tick 
If it is a filler, it's just good to have. If you have time, we will do it. It's good to have it, but if it is not there, nothing is going to change. And if it's a killer, which is kind of no one wants it except the product folk, then it's a clear no. So that's how, <laughs> that's how we do it because all of us know this. Like I, I'm sure this, uh, the co-panelists also will agree. Product, uh, the biggest problem is prioritization. Like yeah. how much of I score and all of these you put, you know, suddenly it becomes a tug of war. People want their idea against my idea against somebody's idea. There is always a bias that sets in. So we always put the blame on the other side. We say, okay, fine, go do a research, come back, prove with data, prove with customer insight. If the customer right. is going to pay for the product, if the customer is going to use the product, you can get the go ahead. So that's how we actually do it when we have uh, no such a wide product stream. Thanks, thanks, Sai. I mean, uh, one important thing that Sai says is the voice of the customer. Jeff Bezos in his meetings, he used to I mean, if there are five people sitting, he used to have one empty chair, which talks about every feature that they talk about in terms of prioritizing, will it add value to the customer? Or is it going to be a killer or, or the terminologies that they use? So prioritization becomes important. We, we have another five, 10 minutes, I would assume. And uh, so we'll, we'll finish uh, two questions to you guys and then uh, go, to the, go to the audience for a round of questions if they have. But just taking a cue from what uh, Sai was saying about, um, you know, rolling out new products, there has to be a value, there has to be uh, features that we prioritize and how we go to the market. What, what do you guys do in your area, uh, which is enterprise segment? How do you go about identifying the need? How do you go about testing it? How do you go about rolling it out? What, what do you guys prioritize and how do you go about doing it? Most companies, most products, right? They, they almost always start with some kind of a solution selling, right? It's not, it's not like I go build a product by myself and then try to go fit it where there is a need for it, but you go try to uh, identify a need that exists already and then try to build something towards it that then adds value, makes it uh, say feasible for you to build and also makes say revenue for the company to sustain. And uh, M2P FinTech, again, typically we started in the payment space almost uh, more just over eight years ago now to kind of fill that void where um, a lot of the digital payments before it even became a thing, right, with UPI and those were like three, four years old now, but eight years ago, FinTech even as a term was not like uh, properly coined or understood back at the time. So what happened was, though we started small with a like a small sliver of, uh, say, a product or a product line, working with banks, working with FinTechs, and as the ecosystem was evolving, right, where customers were more open to ever adopting digital payments, uh, we saw the need where we can kind of build those ancillary products, take ownership of those things. Otherwise, as I said, somebody else is going to build it and say, go and try to say, sell it to the same banks again, right? So at least, again, some of the uh, rules of thumb that we have is not, again, is that, is that core to our strengths? Is that something a good, uh, say, addition to our own existing product line or a portfolio? What is do we have the skill set to go build it and then also kind of trying to see if we can build it off and say branch it off as a separate product product line that has its own kind of path and uh, say uh, as a revenue generator. And uh, also what's the longevity rate? Is there also to an extent say geographically expandable? Is it commoditized in a way that what I build here and say do it for India, can I also kind of leverage it in other South Asian markets, in Middle East, in the West, EU, North America, things like that. So some of those things obviously and with, with those kind of considerations is how, is how we've kind of built, uh, uh, going from again a payments and a card based issuance and a program management platform to now including say core banking, uh, including a whole, a whole suite of lending stack, right? Any NBFC or a bank can come in and in say in a matter of few months can start an entirely new business line off of our platform with very little integration into say their own existing systems, things like that. So some of those we, we've kind of been very uh, focused in how we've kind of built them, but on the downside, um, I am uh, also to an extent uh, uh, very passionate about uh, killing products that won't work, right? People, to some extent, uh, you, you have a lot of, say, personal affinity you develop, say, to products you've created yourself, and you kind of keep justifying why something still needs to be there and you need to keep managing it, but you fail to see the kind of cost of maintenance or the overhead that you run, even though it's not making a lot of money. So. Uh, we try to keep it keep it very clean and probably focus our time and efforts on the things that add value and uh, say uh, are good in the in the long term outlook perspective. But that those have been the uh, 
guidelines yes thanks thanks Bharat. i think i think one of the important thing for any founder co-founder or who who are starting a company you get so involved in the products and the feature set that it gets very difficult to kill it you know from your perspective you had some thought process and you built it but you should also be, have a, a business sense and if you have to kill kill a product you sh i mean kill a feature you have to kill it or or uh, uh, or, or look at an extension of how you drive it. One one important thing that evolved from what Sai and Bharat said, uh, Kaushik, is uh, from B2C perspective, it, it can be a little difficult to understand the adoption. Uh, has, has that feature been used, not used? From Bharat's perspective, he could still talk to the customer and find out if it has driven value. So what, what tech or what analytics, how do you ensure if an adoption is there for a feature set and uh, should we do some improvement there, uh, that will lead to some growth, right? So how do you go about doing it in your space? Um, so there are um, at least the product management team inside uh, Kisflow is very fond of uh, two phrases. Uh, one is uh, no, not now. And uh, the second is just enough. Just enough. Right? Um, we are a platform company, and uh, as a platform company, what happens is uh, most of the times we have to distill the feedback that our customers give and figure out to build a feature that would align with our platform, right? So um, it's a little hard for us in that way because uh, customers are very passionate about like some problems that they encounter in their version of the, I mean, uh, in their implementation of the platform. And uh, they are um, yelling at the top of their voices saying, hey, you know what, I need this feature. This feature would like make life so much more easier for a lot of people. Um, take a step back and realize that that's a very unique problem that that customer alone is facing. And uh, not many other people actually even worry about it have, or have actually noticed about this uh, uh, missing or this gap in our feature set. So in such cases, um, even if the customer is a very huge ticket customer of ours, uh, we end up saying, we, uh, I don't think we can like build this uh, feature. Um, and another way that we actually look at things is um, uh, the way we design our feature set, we plan our product per se, is uh, we follow internally uh, what we call uh, the WINES framework of identifying features. So um, uh, the WINES uh, framework essentially stands for winners, invisibles, needs, sellers, and experiences. Right? Uh, and the most important in that, for us at least, is uh, the winners bit. So the winner is something that is going to uh, take the platform and make it a huge success. So that's uh, strategic in nature. That's our vision for what the product is eventually going to be, right? Then comes uh, sellers. So we have like competitors doing certain things and our sales team constantly keeps com uh, coming to us and saying, hey, you know what? If you actually build this feature, it would be easier for me to sell the product. Needs then comes in, which is what customers come and like tell us, hey, you know what, this is missing, we need to solve this problem. And if it's not there, it's actually not giving us a great experience. And invisibles are what our engineers essentially do, essentially changing the uh, workings of our uh, un uh, underlying uh, technology, uh, improvising, speeding things up, uh, distributing, et cetera, et cetera. And experiences, um, the UX uh, per se, as in like, uh, what can I do to like make this product more easily accessible, more easily uh, usable by uh, folks, right? Um, so this is the sequence in which we look at things. And uh, we always say, hey, you know what? If a need or a seller does not align with our winners, does not align with what we think the product has to become over a period of time, then we will not do it. And if we want more out of a feature set or more out of a feature, we say, hey, you know what, this is enough. And we, um, we track this in various ways. Uh, one is uh, qualitative feedback from all our customers um, directly. 
we as product managers go and like speak uh, to our customers. Second is uh, we look at our tickets. Um, lots of um, uh, not an issue tickets per se. These because uh, there are people who are coming and like opening up conversations, saying, "Hey, you know, we have these problems," and uh, we say, "Hey, you know what? That's the behavior of the product, or that's the behavior of uh, the platform, or you know, you probably got it wrong. You have to do it this way, right?" Now these are great uh, sources to like recognize uh, uh, places for improvement. Then analytics, uh, we have uh, we have tried uh, a lot of uh, ready-made analytics tools out there in the market, and then we realized that we want to purpose build it because none of them were actually helping us out. And uh, the easiest way to like actually get started in your analytics journey, hard tip guys, is to essentially pipe your entire logs, server logs, into a queryable system, and you have analytics in place. So you have analytics, qualitative, direct, qualitative, uh, indirect, and then you have your vision as well on top of all of these. Thanks. And then putting it all together, and we have uh, a way to like um, plan our roadmap and like keep the product relevant. Thanks, thanks, Koshik. So, so one of the things is voice of the customer, uh, analytics, looking at the metrics, uh, having features that would sell that we could monetize. Um, again, this topic is quite huge in terms of uh, you could do a session for go-to-market, you can do a session for the MVP, pricing strategy, customer service, engineering, tech stack, so it, it goes on and on. Uh, but, but we'll stop here. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention is, um, you know, the, the, the kind of opportunities again, uh, with, with the advancement of the new tech, um, I mean, there's quite a lot that has happened on the social, mobile, uh, analytics, and cloud. Uh, but we're still in the early stages with respect to AI, ML, AR, VR, uh, or blockchain. And there's quite a lot of opportunities that you could look at in terms of driving the digital transformation for the enterprise segment using these technologies, which is just not an enabler, but a driver as well. With that, I'll stop here. And if there are any questions we could take, um, I'll to you guys. There are only two things that I could infer. Either you guys did not connect with what we said, or you are like, to heck with you guys, we are not going to ask any questions. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the insightful discussion. And uh, this is a question to maybe Kaushik. We were talking about uh, people sticking to your platform. How do you take them along with the technology advancement? Are they ready to upgrade? And how are we able to convince that will be one of the challenges, I guess? So um, we've gone through five versions of our platform. And uh, we realized that most of the times, around 80 to 90% of our customer base is OK with like an upgrade, like a major upgrade. So some, uh, one day you see like something and the next day you see a completely different screen and they are okay with it. Of course, we ease the pain by ensuring that we are like constantly communicating to them that there is going to be an upgrade and things are going to change, et cetera, et cetera. However, there would be 10% uh, who are strongly resistant to it. And uh, these 10%, we have to handhold them. We have our account managers working with them like, uh, to uh, you know, slowly nudge them through the change, but uh, the rest 90% has been a smooth uh, transition for us. I mean, it has been a very systematic transition. Uh, uh, we communicate that on this day your platform is going to get upgraded, and uh, no extra charges, uh, and uh, uh, so be ready for it. And these are the new things that you can like enjoy. And most of the times, our upgrades have actually had more value to our customers. So they are, uh, I've also had, um, uh, uh, you know, instances where customers come to us and say, hey, you know what, push us ahead during your upgrade because we want these features. And we uh, essentially say, hey, you know what, we need to slow you down because we want to like ensure that there are a couple of things that are like in place already. So um, uh, it's very uh, subjective, but, uh, 90% do not complain, they are actually happy. The 10% have 
however smooth you try to make the transition, there will be folks who say, hey, you know what, I don't want things to change. I don't want things to get better. I'm familiar with what I have with, uh, uh, right now. So yeah, you will have those guys around as well. Thanks, Koshik. Yeah, it was really nice. And uh, one thing that is common for all of us is customers, right? Uh, uh, how inclusive are we having the customer in our journey? Because, uh, uh, you know, they have a say. Uh, at the end of the day, we can take something and we, we can leave something. But how inclusive are we? How inclusive when it comes to clients or customers? Right. So, um, I mean, it, it all depends upon what is the problem that you're trying to solve and uh, where your customers are sitting. For B2C, with respect to SAI, it might be slightly different. Uh, for, for the enterprise segment, like what Bharat is doing, it will be uh, slightly different. So you go with a, a base set of features based on some market analysis and doing some interview. Sometimes you could sign up with pilot customers. The first 20 customers, you sign up with them, uh, have them part of your journey in terms of defining your roadmap, um, where you kind of in incentivize them uh, in terms of using the product that there's something that you can give back to them in the initial days. Uh, so it all depends upon the segment that you are in and the kind of problem that you are trying to solve. End of the day, it has to drive a value. So if you are a startup, I, my, my recommendation would be to identify a set of 10, 15 accounts, sign up with that CXO or, or CIO, invest on them, and uh, so you get a feedback. End of the day, the, the kind of feedback that you get also should be able, then you go for scaling up, right? So you, you try and be very careful in terms of whom you sign up with. You don't want to sign up with uh, uh, your uh, close family or anything because they're going to say okay with for any feature. Are they really going to use it or not? So those are the finer recipe that you have to discover along the journey, signing up with a set of uh, uh, customers or, or uh, CXOs. That would be my take, but uh, if there's anything else that you guys want to share, uh, Bharat. Yeah, so to add to what Ratna said, right, so we work with a lot of the banks as well as fintechs and the engagement level is very, very different between them. So with fintechs who are more open to feedback, who are more open to even giving feedback in the first place, there is a quicker turnaround flow where they are very open, they right away tell you if something doesn't work and they need that fixed quickly as well, right? While for banks, the, the lead time to work with them and the kind of to put a change in, go through, say, their own change management processes are much, much different. And they are very wary of giving feedback on very specific things as well. So it also depends on who your customers are, what your engagement levels are, and, and how uh, receptive will they be when you make a change based on an initial request that you came uh, uh, and, and are making it on. And then how do you communicate that back, right? So obviously, it, it, a lot of, the, lot of that depends on how that specific customer segment or that small set of customers are being managed by you as a company and how you're kind of communicating that out to them as well. Thanks, thanks. I think uh, one, one more question we can take. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for this. Uh, probably it is for all the product managers. So mm -hmm. one way of getting feedback is from the customers as you spoke, you said what is relevant for the customers. But uh, other perspective is that what is being offered in the market, right? So look at what is being and a competitive products. So how do you keep an eye of what's happening in the market? And as product managers, how do you feed that into your prioritization? Because that's the most relevant, right? Because if you are probably in the market, whatever you are offering is not in line with what market is offering. How do you handle such requests? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give my version first. So with with every product that we have, right, within say at an epic level, whatever we prioritize. So we do some level of categorization. Are we lacking in feature set as compared to say what our competitors are offering, right? And mark them as like at least feature parity. We need these as table stakes to even compete in a specific say segment. And then the others could be more differentiators where we do something different. So there is a continuous uh, uh, market research, competitor research done by the product team, by the product marketing team, including the sales team, right? And, and it's a function or it's a, part of the responsibility of every single function within the company to kind of identify how competitors work, how they are kind of trying to differentiate themselves, and then so that we can kind of feed and to some extent catch up, but also leapfrog and kind of do something differentiating over the long run. So I think it has to be imbibed as a culture across. It, it cannot be one person's job. And the prioritization of it definitely has comes back to the product manager and 
though they might collate the feedback from those different people, then he, the, the product manager, he or she, will then kind of take the, uh, the decision on, okay, probably this is the most important one based on, again, one, two, three, four considerations, and then move forward with that. Uh, we're running short of time, so we'll have to keep it real quick, Kaushik. Uh, uh, the, the other side to it, I just wanted to like, speak about. Uh, most of the times, if you are following competitors, uh, it could also lead to an echo chamber effect because uh, in, lots of product ca uh, in lots of cases, one competitor does something, the other competitor copies, 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 and then you are left and you are like, wondering if you should, you should also implement that feature or not. Uh, and uh, in, uh, this could actually be a very easy way by which you uh, uh, wear off your uh, intended vision for your entire product. So uh, we should be watchful. It's, it's always great for product no managers to know what other competitors are doing, but they need not always necessarily act on it. Thanks, thanks, Koshik. I think Sai also touched upon it uh, when, when she spoke about how they look at the competition. But one important thing is, to, to, have, to consider someone as a worthy rival, right? I mean, you, you have to consider some product as a worthy rival, not as a competition, but try and see if they are, if they are uh, operating in the same market space, how they are evolving, what they are doing, and then kind of do a, a check with your customers if that's something that they need, and then go on to that feature. We'll stop here, uh, and uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for listening patiently to us. Uh, happy to do or talk offline as well if there are more questions. But you guys have been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the moderator and the panelist. So the delegates, our panelists along with the moderator will be available uh, downstairs too. So if you guys want to have any one-on-one -on -one interaction with them, you're most welcome. You can have the discussions done in person. And I request the panelist and the moderator kindly please stay back. As a panelist honorary, I request Mr. Ratna Kumar Nagarajan to kindly please felicitate Mr. Kaushik Ram Krishna Sai, the Director of Product Management, Kiss Flow. I also request Mr. Ratna Kumar to kindly please felicitate Mr. Bharat Srinivas Rangan, the Senior Vice President of Products, M2P Fintech. So now to Mr. Bharat Srinivas Rangan, the Senior Vice President of Products, MTP Fintech. Next, I request Mr. Ratnakumar to kindly please felicitate Ms. Sai Chitra Swaminathan, the Chief Products Officer of Matrimony.com. I now request Mr. Sindhil Kumar R, the Regional Head of NASCOM, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry, to kindly please hand over the moderator honorary to Mr. Ratna Kumar Nagarajan, the Chief Product Officer of KTON.